San Francisco Bay to Mare Island Navy Yard come submarines of the 19th Pacific Fleet. For the officers and men, it is hail and farewell, the last salute to their ship's ensign. Their craft now decommissioned, the honored flag is presented to the oldest man aboard, oldest in his vessel's service. The deadly torpedoes of these submarines helped cut Japan's lifeline in the Pacific. They sank nearly five million tons of enemy shipping. Now the vessels are retired, but kept in condition. Hulls are sandblasted to receive special paint against corrosion. Below, engines, pumps, air compressors, steering and diving motors are put in perfect working order. Later, the submarine is sealed against air. Deck guns get a coating of a special plastic, a cocoon which is airtight and moisture proof. If needed again, these submarines could be ready in 10 days. Today, America's submarine fleet rests from its work of war, but remains ready to defend the peace it helped to win. war-borne arm of radar reaches forth to touch the moon. Streaking 238,000 miles out into cosmic space, a high-frequency radio beam bounces off the moon and back to Earth. The magic of radar, born in battle up to now, has shown its greatest use in war, a weapon unsurpassed in warning of enemy attack by air and sea. But today's experiment, in an isolated shack atop a hill in eastern United States, may well open vast new fields for peacetime study. It is early morning and the moon is on the rise. Army scientists have aimed the steel antenna and are ready to hurl a powerful radio beam directly toward the moon at the speed of light. 238,000 miles and back. The radar wave begins its journey reaches the moon and is reflected back to Earth, making the round trip in two and a half seconds. Soon, wave after wave was dispatched. They bounced back. The case was proved. The Earth's atmosphere had been pierced. The specially designed receiver is tuned. This is it, this tiny wriggling thread of light. The distance between the two peaks shows the total mileage traveled. And here is the actual image of the first radar beam ever reflected from the moon. The moon itself, planet of mystery to humans ever since Galileo peered through the first telescope, now touched by an electronic finger, may someday be touched by human exploration. No longer beyond man's dreaming is the possibility of spaceships to commute between the two planets. For now, at last, a beam of man-made energy has reached the moon. Who can say it will not be followed by man himself? Two American bridges across the Rhine River at Mainz. The first, a vehicle bridge, is open to automobile traffic. Built in three months, this highway structure across the Rhine connects the American and French zones of occupation in Germany. General McNarney, commander of United States forces in Europe, is welcomed at the French end of the two-lane span. Nearby, a second bridge, a railroad bridge, is dedicated to General George C. Marshall, former United States Chief of Staff. With General McNarney aboard and a full load of soldiers on top, the first train crosses the 3,100-foot span, the only rail link between Western Europe and the American zone. Two important arteries for Allied administration are opened across the Rhine. At Shanghai, troops of China's new 6th Army get pre-sailing DDT treatment against disease before they leave on American tank landing craft for Manchuria, where they will do occupation duty. These crack troops are well equipped for the sub-zero weather in the northern province.
26,000 men are being moved, with each vessel carrying 1,000 men with full equipment. It is part of America's wartime pledge to her great Chinese ally, which held off the Japanese invader for seven terrible years. In Manchuria, these veterans will make peace a reality. The American Outdoor Speed Skating Championships in Minnesota. And here's the finish of the 220-yard men's final, won by Bob Fitzgerald in a close finish. The ladies take the ice, and Miss Beatrice Ammon outskates the field to win the women's 220-yard sprint. In the men's 880-yard race, Ken Bartholomew sets the pace into the final turn, but slips and falls, and Bob Fitzgerald puts on a burst of speed to win the title. At Lewiston, Maine, the kids and their elders try snowshoe racing. It looks easy, but it's a fast way to get very, very tired. The girls are all set to start their race. There they go, and one little lady is out of it before she starts. Here's the finish, and a warm welcome for the winner. At Madison Square Garden, New York, the 60-yard dash, and Eddie Connell fairly flies to victory in six and two-tenths seconds. In the pole vault, two of the entries tie for first. Milton Padway goes over at 13 feet, six inches. Our Jensen leaps over the bar at the same height, and it's a dead heat. The start of the celebrated Wanamaker Mile with McMitchell, pre-war champion, and the American debut of the French star Marcel Hansen. The last lap, Tommy Quinn moves up to challenge McMitchell, but America's ace fights him off and wins in four minutes, 19 seconds. From Southampton, England, the first of 13 ships sails with the first contingent of English brides of American soldiers. The American liner Argentina, converted for the trip, has two special kitchens, nursery, and playrooms, as well as several thousand paper diapers, all to make things easier for the English-born mothers of these half-American children. During the trip, they all get acquainted and wonder what their adopted country is going to be like. Before long, life in America will be commonplace, but a fresh piece of fruit now is a delicate treat. New York City, and the brides have stayed up most of the night to get their first glimpse of their new home. There are 458 brides, 175 babies, all of them new Americans. Their husbands and relatives-in-law and a welcoming nation receive them with happiness and warmth.